Okay, so you guys should all see that presentation now. You should hopefully be able to hear me clearly. Um, I'm just going to set up some sound as well. So, yeah, so these days, finally, we're loading everything onto YouTube as well. So um, you should be able to see old presentations. Uh, but for that, I've also got to get mic'd, unfortunately, because they drop a different audio track over the top of it. Um, yeah, but what a month it's been. Yeah? We <laughs> actually, when I started writing up this presentation, I was like, what are we going to talk about? Like, there's just so, so much that's happened in July. Um, it's actually a little bit insane uh, that uh, if you actually look back at uh, all that's happened, but we're going to run through it today. And uh, so I'm just getting the last of the stuff mic'd up. And we should be able to. Okay, so my lapel mic. It's not going to change your guys' audio, unfortunately. So you're going to be stuck on the normal audio, but uh, on the YouTube clip, it should be a little bit cleaner. Um, let's just put that on a color. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So let's just get the audio ready. Uh, cool. cool, okay, let's get started. Um, so we've got, uh, today we're talking about uh, July monthly review. <clears throat> so we do these uh, presentations every month and uh, it's uh, really just a rundown of what happens in our managed portfolio, uh, kind of ideas uh, around stocks and, and how we see the market at the moment. Um, it's also uh, yeah, going to give us time to review the managed portfolio, what we're doing on the managed portfolio, we have a look at the performance, uh, we look at the general markets, currencies, commodities, and a whole lot of other things. Uh, but for those of you that have never joined one of these presentations before, if you've never, you've never uh, been on, on a call, um, and you're not sure who we are, but you might have seen some of the marketing material, um, just to kind of introduce us, uh, if you don't know who Rand Swiss is, we, uh, 2019, we're a South Africa's top stockbroker, currently ranked number three. We're in the process of doing the awards at the moment. Uh, so we're going to find out who the 2021 guys are probably in the next month or so. Uh, if you are a client and you haven't voted yet, please go and vote. We, we've sent around the, the, the mailers just with the link. Um, if you haven't got the link, please ask us. It really makes a huge difference to us. Uh, uh, so we want you guys to go and have your say. Uh, currently, you know, last year we got top tax-free savings account. Uh, this year we've kind of added a managed flavor to our tax-free savings accounts as well. But they're essentially free to clients um, that, uh, no, they're free to clients uh, as long as you've got a secondary account with us. So if you're not a, a Ransom's client, obviously we don't offer you a tax-free savings account. Um, and we rank, rank the top online broker as well. So we do a lot of, uh, that's with Christo and them, uh, we do a lot of that as well. So uh, yeah, if you haven't voted in the awards, you don't have the link, please contact us and, and, and help us out. Um, so what do we do? Okay, we do a whole lot of different things with different banks. We've got this huge network of partners. Uh, we work in the JSC, you'll see behind us, they're actually renovating the JSC. So you see that's, I mean, one of their boardrooms at the moment. Um, they're busy tearing our entire offices apart. So the JSC has been renovating for a couple of months. It's all of dust and it's really been horrible to work here, but I think it's going to look beautiful when it's done. I think they're just trying to take advantage of what's going on under COVID. Um, so our kind of main product, uh, we do online training, which is obviously what, what we kind of started the business around. We give you access to, to financial markets, the JSE systems, but we also give you, you know, total international trading that you really are, uh, can do all, you can do all of it yourself. And it's very much a self-directed uh, client that, that takes care, you know, that takes up, us up on the online trading systems. Um, in terms of private broking, this is uh, for clients 5 million and above. It's very much, uh, you know, much more hands-on. You're going to have a personal dealer, Vama kind of will take care of you, run around, do research, bespoke research for you, source research reports. You know, you, you need a, a statement on something. It happens instantly. You don't have to go on the system and pull your own statements, that kind of stuff. So um, you really just got someone that's going to work with you to build and manage your portfolios. If you're not sure what's happening on a corporate action, you've got someone that can, can assist you with that corporate action. So that's a private broking. Managed portfolio is what I take care of. Um, you know, it's, it's essentially stockbroking portfolios, so they're not funds, uh, but we do uh, se se segregated stockbroking portfolios, but we take full discretion uh, on buying and selling positions for you. It's all done to a house model portfolio. So 
Um, I've got my own cash in the in the portfolio, and whenever I make a decision or, or change a weighting or you know, down weight, up weight, and that's what we're going to talk about today, um, I do the exact same thing on your underlying portfolio. We generate a fact sheet for you once a month. We do this uh, event as well, where we just kind of chat about um, you know the ins and outs of the portfolio, and um, and yeah, the, it was achieved our five-year track record and uh, we've outperformed S&P 500 uh, and all other markets. It's not a particularly speculative discretionary portfolio that we've got. It's really designed for clients that you know, are going overseas and, and want uh, you know, direct share investment. Um, that's kind of more nesting portfolio. It's not super speculative. If you want to do super speculative stuff, we have nothing, nothing against that, but we do that on the online trading or private broking. Um, we've got clients with the uh, trusts that trade uh, crypto even. Um, nothing, nothing, nothing to stop you doing that. Obviously, when you give me money to manage, it's a very different prospect. I, I kind of uh, you know, feel an additional obligation to making sure that you <laughs> make money. So maybe I'm a little bit more risk averse than I would be with, with uh, maybe my own cash or, or more risk averse than you would be happy to to work with if you were uh, doing something a bit more speculative but they are pretty conservative portfolios and i'm going to go through the, the risk reward metrics as well a little bit later on verve governor takes care of our structured products um you know we've got some really cool stuff so that, that he's done recently um so he's kind of always looking at you know we've just finished closing an investing product uh, about uh, a month i think we talked about it last month that product is now closed uh, the next one's probably going to be out in October, but we're looking at doing an interim structure in between, which is going to be probably the best of a couple of consumer stocks. So the Mikey Starbucks, and instead of linking to an index like we normally do, we're going to do something a little bit more speculative, but still stick in all the capital protection and, and of course, uh, you know, take on A-grade a uh, bank credit. So Viv will probably be chatting to you guys about that in a little bit as well. Um, offshore transfers, our subs business, uh, subsidiary business. Um, really, we work so much with international money these days that, you know, I'd say 85% of our client base is international, um, that, uh, you know, is transferring money from different jurisdictions and in and out of South Africa and all sorts of things. So um, we've obviously got the dedicated offshore transfer service run by Christo. Um, and that's, uh, you know, weirdly, you've been just surprisingly quiet with such a strong currency. So, you know, you generally see that business pick up uh, when the currency weakens, which is at the wrong time. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, guys obviously transferring money in another country, that's what they do. They do it for, with companies and individuals. And of course, they give us really low cost transfers on anyone that wants to go into a managed portfolio. That's awesome uh, because we can kind of move, move the money at a lot cheaper than you'll be able to do with, a, you know, like one of, let's say, the big four South African banks. Um, Wealth management handled by Yaku. You'll see him on a lot of these webinars as well, talking about RAs and retirement and estate planning and all those those complicated things that that are just way over poor stockbroker's head. <laughs> Tax free savings accounts, as I said, uh, that is a kind of an, a bolt on product that we do for free for all of our clients. Um, and yeah, we've just launched a managed version, which will be kind of announced. Uh, so we've actually done the first implementations. And, and uh, we'll kind of announce the, the full uh, product, uh, or at least we'll do a full product launch in a little bit. So that's kind of what's going on at the company at the moment. Um, but what's going on in the world? Because that's what you guys are here to hear about. Um, so let's go and look at the July, July monthly review. And like I said, like what a month it has been. It has been absolutely insane. So we, we had South Africa looting, which is just which is just mad. I mean, you guys all saw the, the incredibly visual graphics. I'm not going to talk about it because we too much because we generally um you know we, we're looking at offshore markets and kind of like big macroeconomic factors because we're looking at things that affect a global managed portfolio but i mean how wild was the start of this month i mean people were literally afraid to go to their offices i mean we've, we've got partners down in kwazulu Natal, and uh, i mean we were literally getting it it was like you, you know kind of doing teams calls with them but then you know kind of males afterwards just telling us how they formed militias and they're trying to fend off uh, you know attacks i mean wow we live in a frontier economy so for me i think i'm not gonna, gonna, gonna analyze it because there's nothing really to analyze for me i mean yes it looks like an insurrection I mean, there's plenty of horror stories been so well covered in the media but i mean if you if you do not have an offshore component to your investments you got to do it, man. You know, it's kind of what's what's the idea? Live in a warm country, but um, but invest in a cold country. So, um, yeah, so that's really looting, man. If you don't have an offshore portfolio, you know, that was a little bit of a wake up call, I think, for a lot of clients as well. 
Um, on top of that, we had China collapsing. <laughs> so we had regulation. We had you know mass person process, you know, taking a massive dive this month on, on our local market as well. That's going to put in jeopardy a lot of the pension, the pension funds uh, performance. Um, I'm going to go through the, the kind of overall performance and I'm going to talk a little bit more about China in a bit. So I'm not going to go through it too much here, but man, you know. You know, as if looting is not enough, like, you know, the biggest, uh, you know, heavyweight stock in our index, uh, you know, is, is, is just gets destroyed this month as well. So that's, um, again, luckily doesn't affect global global clients. But uh, I mean, if you've got RAs, which are, are obviously, you know, restricted with regulation 28, dangerous times, man. Um, but COVID cases rising, uh, you know, we've, we've had to deal with lockdowns, at least our lockdown is back to level three at the moment, but we've been in lockdown. And on top of all of this, man, because we've got a US earnings season as well. So, um, you know, we've had just company reports after company or report, which is great. Last night, a new finance minister. <laughs> so you think, uh, you think all that excitement wasn't enough. We've now, Peter uh, Bowen has stepped down. We've got, yeah, you know, a new finance minister. Got obviously all the Fed stuff that's come out. Uh, we've got Robinhood listing overseas, and, we've, and you know, if 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 real world uh, kind of uh, market driven stuff wasn't enough to keep you entertained, you got the Tokyo Olympics as well. So a lot of action this month. Um, and let's run through what's actually happened. So global market overview. So we actually did pretty well. Um, you know, so so I just mentioned the, the mass pass collapse. So even though mass pass, which you know, between mass pass and process, they make up you know over twenty percent. Of, of the South Africa, if you want to call it the South African top 40, but the South African market in general, it's got an enormous weight in because we are a market weighted index. So because it's such a large company, it's, uh, it makes up a large chunk of that, that underlying index. Um, and of course, when you get a big drawdown like that, you would have expected the South African market to actually be under a little bit more pressure, but there's been a lot that's kind of counterbalanced that. So on the one hand, we've got higher commodity prices, but this month we've also seen uh, the likes of Kumba, Anglo-American Platinum, Amplats, all releasing, you know, just spectacular results. I mean, you're talking about Kumba releasing, you, you know, uh, publishing that they're going to pay a dividend, which is multiple times their share price from a, from, from a couple of years ago. So, you know, with the, the kind of supply chain disruptions that we've had, uh, you know, thanks to the, the pandemic, uh, we've seen a big curtailing of the supply of so many of these commodities. And what's happened is uh, demand has kind of roared back as lockdowns eased across the world and as the vaccine rollout pro pro progressed. And there just simply isn't enough of the raw material to meet the demand. And what has happened is prices have just gone up. So, you know, kind of digging through those updates, which also because we've been going through South Africa <laughs> season as well. So looking through the, the, the corporate updates. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We haven't really seen the volume numbers coming through from the miners. The, the, the kind of great performance they're getting has nothing to do with volume. So they've actually seen production numbers slightly lower, um, but it's just all about higher prices for their metals and, and, and their ba the base metals, the precious metals and the materials. So um, with that, they're just making super normal profit. Remember, these companies have this big operating leverage. So you know they've got a fixed cost. You sink a mine, you buy your yellow machinery, you build your shafts. You've got some variable costs in your labor, but again, your labor is almost a fixed cost as well. And suddenly, your the, the price of your 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 um, your product goes up. You know, like we've seen with rhodium or the PGM metals or, or, or iron ore these being so elevated, the price of the product goes up. Your costs effectively don't change, and all of that revenue that you get from the higher prices just drops straight down to the bottom line. So you just get these mega mega profits in the mining sector. Now, historically, what's happened is they've actually taken all those profits and they, you know, it's the time when they can go and build new mines. And I mean, you know, when you get a, a company the size of Anglo-American or Billiton or Rio Tinto, essentially what these companies are, they, they're huge bureaucracies as well. So, you know, the, the guys, they're like, well, the prices are up, we've got all the spare cash, what should we do? Let's sink more shafts. Let's go and spend money. Let's grow our, our, our business, which is, which is what they end up doing. And, and generally, that's normally the worst time because, you know, commodities are very cyclical. So the prices have gone up because there's a contraction in supply. So the guys go, hey, let's go and uh, supply a whole lot more. Uh, let's go and supply a whole lot more uh, commodities into the market. There's this huge demand. So they ramp up production, but inevitably they oversupply the market. Prices crash. And, and every, you know, anyone that was buying at that, that time, so sort of the, the, the whole cycle ends in tears. Now, I don't know whether it's because we, we're in a world where information is more accessible or whether there's just something, and it's the most dangerous phrase in financial markets, this time is different. Probably not different, but um, 
This time, you're seeing much, much more subdued capex spend from the from the big mining companies. Like they're just not sinking the shafts, and instead, what they've opted to do is pay these huge dividends. And you know, Glencore has also announced those doing share buybacks. So a lot of money being returned to shareholders rather than expanding the the, the production. Now, if you don't expand the production but demand remains elevated, you could see these commodity prices running for a little bit longer. That's actually very good news for for our local market and our, and our local exchange. So. Um, South Africa up 1.77%. Uh, France also doing well, based, makes it a lot of got, got to do with luxury goods, but the Europe is looking a little bit better, which has been our view that Europe is kind of priced very, very cheaply for what it does. The worry around Europe at the moment, though, is a lot of its companies are a little bit, well, not a lot, but probably about 20% of the European, let's say the Euro stocks 50, is actually exposed to China in some way or, way or the other. Um, now, you know, if you look at the underlying economies, they're doing pretty well. Um, U.S. also not a great month in the in the U.S. across across the broader market. Great month for the tech stocks, um, but not so much for the, the kind of the Russell 2000 smaller mid cap stocks under a little bit more pressure. There's been a bit of a divergence there, so the overall U.S. Uh, market not going up as much. And then obviously the story we, that we've seen in China, which is uh, just this massive regulatory. Uh, change coming out coming out of the the, the, the CCP, um, you know we've had all sorts of things like um, you know ten, ten to, like online gaming is now called spiritual opium, um, and the, the concerns around spiritual the spiritual opium is that they're going to ban. I mean already we've seen uh, measures limiting uh, you know access to you know how long you can play online games in China and companies having to 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 react to that. But uh, you know, kind of state media coming out and, and just highlighting how dangerous they consider online gaming uh, to the health of their population. And what have you got? You've got suddenly Tencent, which is a you know obviously a big gaming company, down massively. On top of that, that's not the only thing that's happening in China. It's you know there's been all sorts of crack, like heavy heavy crackdowns on on many different industries. So uh, private education was one, for example. Um, the authorities decided that uh, private education was. Uh, you know, it was disadvantaging the, the poorer people because people with money could go and, uh, uh, you know, essentially afford private tutors. It became this big, very exciting, very hot sector in the Chinese market. And there was a whole lot of, you know, listed Chinese uh, private education companies. China came out and said, listen, you can't, you can no longer make a profit of private tuition. Um, it destroyed the industry overnight. That was about two weeks ago. Um, and we had those companies down around 70% uh, on the back of that. Um, everyone just getting very concerned about the very heavy-handed way that China is, is acting uh, with its financial markets. It's all sorts of concerns about what's going to happen with ownership for, foreign, for, for foreigners. Um, and as a result, we've seen China down, or, you know, Chinese markets down almost 9%. I mean, the Hang Seng has collapsed, mainland markets have collapsed. It's been a total, total mess uh, in China. So if we just go to the, the, the longer-term view, um, so that's, that's what's happened in the month. You can see China was just managing to stay positive over on, on a one-year view last month when we looked at it that nine percent slide has now taken china negative and you can see china's the, the orange line over here um so that orange line there china you can see it's really the, the regulatory crackdown and the, the pressure that uh, china has been putting on financial markets started in february and it's just been a steady slide since since february as people have exited those markets and, and, and they've almost become un, unwilling to you know it's been almost impossible to invest there um you know, Japan's, you know, Japan also, Japan is kind of this, I don't know what you call it, like a move. Um, so they, uh, they also, you know, under a lot of pressure, and it's the whole region is, is kind of suffering because, uh, you know, when China suffers, that whole region is going to suffer. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, US, U, U, US and Europe doing a little bit better than, than some of the emerging markets. I haven't got it on here, though, but uh, the likes of India has actually done very, very well. So I've got South Africa at the top of the table for today. Um, you know, we've just kind of squeaked ahead with it with that good performance. We're a little bit ahead of France now. Um, yeah, so oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so a little, little bit ahead of, ahead of France for the year. And uh, yeah, it's 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 very much like I said, driven driven by the mining stocks. Um, others, I don't know. So, so I mean, I put this uh, chart on Twitter, and immediately you get all the clever guys going, "Hey, but what about uh, Vietnam? What about all these other economies?" So I'm just looking at kind of the big economies that, that are comparable uh, to to South Africa the best. So the light, yes, we, we haven't done the best over one year. Vietnam has done a little bit better. Um, I think the UAE has done a little bit better. Sweden has done better. But I'm talking about 
big kind of like you know G7 nations. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what we're comparing uh, our market to. Um, and it just gives you a flavor of how the, the, the geographies are working overseas. Now, we, we're still very, very pro the U.S. Um, I mean, we've been overweight the U.S. for a long time. Very happy with the, the U.S. exposure. We've outperformed the MSCI world because of it. Um, and we are starting to shift into, into Europe. So we, we've looked at Europe now. We've launched a European and a U.K. portfolio, the kind of little subsidiary portfolios. It's not to say that we, this, the, the portfolio that I manage specifically is a global portfolio. We can invest in anything. We can do whatever. That's the mandate. We, we remain heavily over, overweight the U.S. We like U.S. markets compared to everywhere else. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have some diversification into Europe and some diversification into China. Um, yeah, we kind of uh, we still own Alibaba. The view is stick with Alibaba. We, we're not getting out just yet. It's very difficult to tell whether this is an amazing buying opportunity in Chinese markets or whether this is going to be a persistent long-term downtrend. Um, you know, I kind of quizzed everyone on the desk about it as well. And, I, and, and, and this is kind of the view that, that we're giving clients. Um, and it's the way that we are thinking about it. So I asked Christo, you know, buying, selling, holding, what are we doing on Chinese markets? You know, he's a very technical guy. He looks at it and he's, he kind of looked at the, you know, just the Chinese markets and earnings terms compared to the likes of the U.S. markets. Now, China has always been cheaper in, in earnings terms to, compared to the U.S., but uh, the difference now is that, um, you know, even with the fall, you know, if you compare China to itself, it's not the cheapest Chinese markets have been historically. So he's saying, even though Chinese markets have fallen, he thinks there's a little bit more downside. His call was to sell. I asked Verb, and I'm going to go through Verb's kind of history of China in the next slide. But um, I asked Verb, Verb, we're selling Alibaba because it's really our only big Chinese exposure. We're selling Alibaba, we're we keeping Alibaba. What's the story here? He says, you know, he's got this whole, you know, view on, on the demographics in China. He says, China, there's a there's serious systemic problems in China. But he says markets have priced it a, a lot cheaper. He would say, don't sell, just hold, let's see what happens. Because if you do see a turnaround in, uh, in, the, in the policy making in China, you know, the opportunity is massive. Um, finally, um, finally, uh, I asked Yaku, I said, Yaku, come on, surely you're like me. China's got 1.4 billion people in it. Now, there's problems, there's always problems, but the best opportunity to buy anything is when uh, it looks the bleakest. Uh, you know, the, the old saying goes that uh, you know, stocks aren't both cheap and popular at the same time. When stocks are selling off, well, that's the time to buy them. When it, you, you know, if you had, if you had said, oh, but look how bad things are, we're in lockdown, it, it, you know, at the, the depths of uh, the coronavirus, you wouldn't be up a year ago if you were still panicky about what was happening. I mean, remember, we lived in a very different world. You would have dropped forty-two percent in dollars by not investing in South Africa. So, you know, it's when things are tougher that that make for great investment opportunities. And the African said, "Of course," he says, "For him, it's a buy." So, our desk has literally come out with a sell, hold, and buy. Now, for me, I looked at that and I was like, "Wow, that's that in itself tells a story." And that's the story that I'm going to tell to clients because, you know, if you look at it. What, what is the reason that China is falling? It's not because it ha doesn't have an incredibly exciting population. It's not because the companies that are run in China are not amazing companies. The problem really is the administration and the policies that are being put in place there. Now, when you have irrational policies be, being, uh, being you know, introduced, it's almost impossible to, to value companies because it's, the, it's very different from the US where we've got a stable regulation system and the way that you value the company is you go, how many iPhones are gonna be sold? What are the revenue numbers? You know, you're looking at the market and you're trying to make predictions uh, in, a, in a sensible framework uh, of how the, 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 the company will perform. When you're looking at China, you're not just trying to understand how the company itself is going to perform in that environment. You're also trying to understand how the rules are changing. Now, you, you know, <laughs> we've got the British and Irish Lions in town at the moment as well. You know, and I'm not going to go through the Rossi Erasmus thing. But, you know, if, you, if you're just looking at one team versus the other team, you're looking at the skills of the players when one, play, one team is playing the other, you can make a reasonable guess. This is a stronger team that's going to beat them. But when you've also got to try and work out how the ref is going to blow the game, and it, it might have nothing to do with the actual rule book, it changes the whole prospect of investing there. It, it becomes incredibly difficult uh, to value stocks. And that's why you're getting such divergent views across the board as to whether this is an opportunity or whether it isn't. So the way that we are thinking about it in our portfolio at the moment is keep small exposure to China, but... Um, but yeah, so it, because it's a great diversifying factor, we, we put out that investor product, which um, we actually executed, we executed about there so that the product struck uh, just, I think it was the 21st of the month. 
Um, so that's kind of where, where, the, where you're striking on, on the Chinese uh, product. It would be somewhere around there. So you've seen it has dipped a little bit more. It's a four-year product, but it's got capital protection. If things go wrong, you can get all your money back. It's kind of like making that. If things go, go wrong, you get all the money back. But if things go wildly right, there's no capped upside. And I mean, I talked about it before. I think I talked about it last month, um, maybe not in this, this uh, webinar series, but um, you know, the China, China in history has actually encouraged its population to go and buy shares. Uh, you know, if, that, if, if you see that kind of change in policy, you could literally see uh, Chinese markets up two, three, four hundred percent. So um, I think a small exposure, you kind of take a, what we call a barbell approach. Majority of the money sits in, in the US, but a small amount needs to be sitting in, uh, in developed uh, uh, okay, okay, I've got a question here as well, just about the Maspus process swap. So we're sending out a communication on the Maspus process deal today. Uh, it really comes down to, I, I personally prefer process as a whole, if, if I'm implementing new clients, um, or if, if you don't have a big tax liability, I would probably prefer to hold process. I get the sense, and I've put this out in research notes for you guys already, I get the sense that a lot of the value unlock is going to be had in process rather than in, in Maspus. Um, that said, you've got to take into account, uh, you know, your tax position as well. If you bought an at 400 Rand and you're sitting with an enormous capital gain, it is going to trigger a capital gain. So just be careful when you do the switch, um, you've got to take into account your tax as well. So processes are preferred, but you've got to take into account the capital gain. But we can kind of chat about that more offline. Um, we are sending a research note out about it in, in a bit. Yeah, so quickly back to China, I've just got one more slide. So this is a wonderful uh, little report that Verve put together around um, around China in general. Um, and he says China, you know, and one of the concerns, and like I said, he's kind of got a hold on China at the moment because he's very concerned about the, the, uh, the regulatory issues. So he says, in his mind, China is, uh, you know, has a history of self-sabotage. He says, he's just gonna give three examples. So, well, it's actually four, but I'll, I'll, give, I'll give them two here. Um, so the first is Chinese treasure ships. So you might you might have heard him talking about Chinese treasure ships before, but you know you all know the story of Christopher Columbus. He took three ships, about ninety sailors, and headed across to America. Kind of started the the era of exploration, which you know essentially resulted in colonization and ended in untold wealth for Europe as they basically stripped the rest of the world of all their resources. Now. Um, you might not know this, but before that, year, hundreds of years before this, there were Chinese treasure ships. Now, these ships were way bigger. I mean, there were kind of like three, 400 of these treasure ships uh, that would go on these journeys. They had kind of like 25,000 people uh, you know, across the, the fleet, and they were going everywhere from China all the way to East Africa. But what happened with the treasure ships, instead of colonizing the world and really just like building up an empire, um, China was so focused on, on, on its own internal politics that the state kind of pulled the, 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 the idea of these, uh, you know, big, uh, you, you know, roving ships that were far superior from the technological point of view to Columbus, and they just pulled them. And as a result, China didn't colonize the world, Europe did. So, you know, again, it came down to the internal politics in China uh, broke the system. Then you look at, uh, okay, what's called, he calls it that giant leap forward. Um, this really came down to, uh, you know, uh, Chairman Mao's whole policy around um, uh, kind of centralization and kind of following a much more, more communist um, uh, system. Uh, what resulted was the Great Famine, 55 million people dead. What was doing is, what they were doing is essentially they were sending all the surplus food to cities, people in the countryside were starving. They were trying to move, um, you know, industrial production out of the cities. They were building things like furnaces just in their backyards to try and move steel production away. It was just crazy communist policies that didn't work. Massive, massive death toll. You then had the Cultural Revolution, where the Red Guard basically destroyed most of uh, China's kind of you know, really long history. Um, you know, there was all sorts of massacres around the Cultural Revolution. Twenty million people dead. And finally, the the One Child policy, which uh, you know, yes, it's limited. Um, it's limited uh, the growth of uh, the Chinese population, which was its objective, but it's created when you have such, when you don't allow market systems to work and you have a very centrally planned economy. What happens is you make one decision and you do that, but the, you don't realize all the ramifications that, that ripple through the ecosystem. And what's happened with the one child policy, yes, there's 30 to 60 million missing girls because um, uh, male, male children were, were much more popular. And there's a huge thing about missing girls, but you know, aside from the human tragedy of the policy, you've got um, you've got essentially an aging Chinese population now. So I think in 2000, uh, the average age in China was around 30. 
Um, these days, I think it's 37 and it's around 37 and a half. So you've got China's whole population starting to age because you've got all these old people and no young people to replace them in the workforce. That is going to cause incredible pressure inside the Chinese economy as these workers eventually retire and there's no one to replace them. Now, that is scary. Now, they've just changed the, the one-child policy fairly recently, but it's, it's a scary, scary place to be in if you're betting on that economy. That's why I said very specific bets. Um, very, very careful bets into China, and we're certainly not betting the farm or, or going boots and all into China. Uh, kind of the biggest concern that, that, that Viv's got around China at the moment is that uh, Xi Jinping is leader for life. Um, they haven't had a leader for life since, uh, you know, the Great Famine, which was one of the reasons that they put in a system where the, 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 uh, the Chinese leader would change every 10 years. The problem is, as you get older, you don't get smarter, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, and the point is that more and more crazy policies will likely uh, come out of China. Um, and, and this is not a stable system. Um, so we're kind of still very concerned about China. I, I don't know if it's, a, you know, like I said, we, I've kind of got it on a hold. I won't be increasing exposure to China. It might be a great opportunity. Do it in, in the right way is all I'm saying. We've kind of chatted about the, the other side of it. Okay, so off China. I've spent like the first 20 minutes talking about China almost. Um, next, vaccines and uh, and what's happening with with COVID. So, hey, okay, so we've had our own lockdowns here. As, as I said, like our own lockdowns are sort of coming through. So you can see up on the top, uh, well, it's like top right, but the left, left chart on the top right. Um, South Africa's cases, I mean, we've just gone through our third wave. We've all probably experienced it. Um, and it is, it is subsiding. So we are starting to come down in the third wave. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the kind of more stringent lockdowns work. Our vaccine rollout is progressing. I also got vaccinated this month, which is why if the presentation is not good, I'm just going to blame the vaccine. Um, United States, you know, heavy vaccination rate cases starting to spike. Globally, we can see the cases are starting to come up. Um, we've got India. So, so India, um, India's cases have actually come way down from, the, from that original spike. Uh, but the, the, the very concerning, there's a couple of places that are concerning. We're starting to see a spike in France. Um, we're seeing a spike in the, uh, okay, so the UK is actually coming down again. Um, but yeah, yeah, I might, I might look a bit wrong. But uh, anyway, the other one is Israel. So there's all these economies all over the place that are starting. That, that are, in Israel, we've always taken this kind of a bellwether because it was highly, highly vaccinated. So with, with such a heavily vaccinated population and coronavirus cases starting to spike, you might see the mortality rates going down, but, um, but coronavirus is not beaten. And, and that's, that's a little bit of a problem. I still believe that uh, from a financial market point of view, it is still rear view mirror. We're still looking at it. It's something that we're going to, I think we, it's something we're going to live with. I think we're going to have to, you know, hopefully the vaccines will allow the mortality rates to drop and it'll just become kind of like a booster shot the way that we combat influenza and it won't be so fatal and we won't go into those hard level five lockdowns again where hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, but they, you know, the future is uncertain. You know, we don't know what variants are going to arise, and markets are still very, very sensitive to this. So, so these are so the top headline was actually from a couple of weeks ago. Dow tumbled seven hundred points. Uh, you know, the worst drop since uh, October as investors fear a resurgence. Markets are concerned about a resurgence. Um, you know, but I do kind of also take the view that uh, you know, kind of almost like the you know, year surge is unlikely to. De derail Canada's plans to welcome back American tourists. Like, I think we're going to learn to live with, with the coronavirus. Humans are very adaptable. Is it going to result in the next big market crash? Um, I don't believe it. I always get asked, you know, I always get clients always send me kind of little snippets of, I read this and my, it means markets are going to crash. Markets crash when people panic. It, it, to generate panic, you need real fear, and fear generally is fear of the unknown. The reason markets crashed over coronavirus is because we had no idea what the impact of these lockdowns and what the impact was going to be. As soon as markets could kind of predict things were getting back to normal, we got that big resurgence up in share prices. They're like, oh, things are going to be okay. I can't see a panic happening around coronavirus unless there's a particularly lethal variant. Uh, that comes out because so much of this knowledge has now been assimilated by financial market professionals and, and by us as the human race. Um, if the markets are going to crash, it's going to be for something other than coronavirus, but it is worth keeping an eye on because it's going to make a difference to the different sectors. It's also, we hold Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson in our portfolios. Their vaccines have not, and we never expected them to be especially profitable um, because you can't go profiteering off a global pandemic where you've got millions and millions of people that have died. But 
Um, if it becomes a more reasonable thing where you have to have it, um, you, you know, vaccines regularly, uh, just to just to kind of like live in the world. I mean, everyone's got very divergent views about that vaccine passports. There's the whole anti-vax movement, sure. But if that does become a new normal, um, there is sort of, sort of profitability that's working into the estimates around these companies. Uh, we're doing a global pharma stock presentation in, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And uh, we're going to look specifically at how they could potentially make those vaccines uh, profitable. Um, and what the opportunities are, but we've seen spikes in Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson share prices as people start to realize that maybe there is profit in this after all. And also as we go back to kind of a, a normal where uh, you know, the drugs that are used in elective surgeries are actually in demand again because hospitals are opening up. Uh, but yeah, coronavirus, not in the rear view mirror yes, yet, yeah, virus is starting to spike. So just be careful. Um, today at uh, 2.30, we have non-farm payrolls. So the chart on the right-hand side hasn't been updated, uh, but the inflation chart has. So inflation is still, we still, we, as I said, uh, we've done a dot plot internally, like we've got our own dot plot. Um, our view is that, uh, that this kind of hump that we're seeing in US inflation is going to be transitory. It's going to drop back, but we think it is going to drop back to just above the 2% level uh, over the longer, a longer period of time. So we're going to have inflation in the US. That's actually very good for stock markets. Uh, it's not great when your your it's not great for fixed income products in the U.S. When your yields are low and inflation is high, you've got a, a you know basically a, a, like a real negative yield um, versus you know positive nominal yield. And uh, yeah, our, our view is that we're going to be slightly slightly elevated in terms of U.S. inflation. Um, unemployment, as I said, we haven't had new unemployment. We've got non-farm payrolls at two o'clock today. I just put up the estimates. I kind of put a poll on the, on the desk as well. Uh, the view on the desk is that we're going to miss. They think it's going to come in at 750,000. Um, yeah, you know, Reuters poll is sitting at 870,000 uh, new jobs added. Um, it is expected that the, the employment rate, which seems to be now, you know, approaching a new frictional level, if you want to put it that way. So we had this big spike out to 10% unemployment in, in the US. Moving all the way down to, you know, on the last point was 5.9. We're expecting 5.7% unemployment in the U.S. now. Um, Jerome Powell seems to have his view set that they can get back to that 3.5% unemployment. Previously, no one would have assumed frictional unemployment was around 3.5%. They would have said that's impossible. You can't employ that many people. Um, now, maybe it is going to come back to, to, to that, that level, which, uh, which is interesting. So I think... Uh, you know, that probably means like if, if we, if, if I think you're going to have a U.S. unemployment running for a little bit longer, same as you're going to have inflation a little bit higher, you're going to have U.S. unemployment running, you know, about 5% for, for a while still. I don't think you're getting back to that 3% uh, level anytime soon. Um, and I think that means that we've got a combinative monetary policy for a little bit longer. Again, combinative monetary policy, heavy fiscal stimulus, um, it's good for stocks. It's great for stocks. A bit of inflation in the system, that's that's positive on stock, for, for stock markets. Why, why do companies not really care about you know, a little bit higher inflation? Well, their products and services they sell, uh, they get more for them. Their revenue numbers inflate as well. It's the people that are sitting on cash that really get punished. So it's about, it's about getting into the market. Um, volatility, I always go just go and have a look at the volatility. Volatility still after that big spike of coronavirus coming back to 17, again, still running a little bit higher than those uh, that, than what we had in 2017 when VIX was sitting at about 12. VIX is the volatility index. People call it the fear and greed index. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically like, it's one of the inputs to option pricing, but it gives you a sense of when, when the VIX is high, that's when people are scared. When, when the VIX is low, that's when people are very nervous. Uh, at least we're very, very calm. Um, and every now and again, you get these spike up, but the, the markets are kind of settled. They have been settled over July. Um, so let's quickly look at the equity markets. Um, so this is just a, a one year heat map, uh, at least a one month heat map. So what's happened to the stocks over the last little bit. Um, if you follow this presentation every, every month, you'll know we've exited a lot of our oil and gas exposure. We've also downweighted our very heavy financial exposure we, we, by cutting Citibank. Um, you know, and uh, it's kind of worked, it was still working out for us. So you know, most of the sector is kind of like generally green. I mean, we had a very, very up, uh, up month last month, a little bit more difficult month, but you know, totally exiting oil and gas after the run up in oil and gas, we kind of pegged 70 to $80 a, a barrel as kind of the top top band of, of, of oil prices. And as such, we sold um, ExxonMobil and Schlumberger. Um, you can see very, very red month for, for, for the oil producers as well. Uh, energy, energy under all sorts of pressure. I think it's, uh, you know, uh, 
I just get the sense that, that we've kind of seen the little run up there. I mean, we still believe that there's been an underinvestment in the sector, but there are a lot of very interesting alternatives that, that are becoming very, very popular. So um, yeah, it's kind of that traditional oil and gas, like we're still a little bit concerned about the sector. We don't have any exposure to it. That's the red sector. Um, yeah, as I said, we've kind of sold down some of our banks, a little bit of pressure there as well. Um, you can see the big red guy up at the top is Amazon. I'm going to talk about Amazon, uh, I think, on the next couple of slides. Uh, that's just around their results, uh, but we're going to go through them. Uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, all of these re releasing results, and uh, they've been pretty good. Uh, overall, the earnings season, which we're also going to talk about, has been pretty good. And as, as I said, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, both in our portfolio, big ticks up this month as well. Um, those ticks up, you know, like we'll go through in the in the future presentation, but looking pretty good. Um, we have, we are kind of trying to also, I mean, remember, we don't just follow like a momentum, we go and buy big tech. That's not not the strategy. We take a portfolio approach to the, the to the the, 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 the the management of client money. Um, and what we've got is we do have, we do actually own a number of value stocks. We think value is an area of the market that is going to come back. It's one of the reasons that we have a much lower risk uh, um, weighted, uh, risk weighted, much better risk weighted performance uh, than, than, than the index, because I mean, we, we like to have kind of like very specific value stocks that, that work well. Um, Procter & Gamble, one of our stocks also up almost 5% for the month. Uh, you know, Nike, uh, where is Nike? Uh, Nike up 7%, that was also results-based, also in the portfolio, all looking very, very good. Um, Really, Amazon has been the kind of the, the, the little bit of a drag on the portfolio. Um, you know, also coming out, so, so the one that I've got to mention is AMD. Uh, I was going to do a whole segment on AMD for you because <clears throat> it's a potential addition. We don't own it, uh, but it's a potential addition to the portfolio. We own NVIDIA as our chip maker. We like NVIDIA. It's one of our best performing stocks. It's going to be reporting on the 19th of this month. Um, and we are heavy in NVIDIA. We are above an 8% weighting in NVIDIA at the moment, and we're getting a little bit concerned. We love the sector, but I get uncomfortable when our portfolio has, has more than more than even 7% in a single stock. We've trimmed NVIDIA before just to get back in line with what we consider a, a comfortable risk weighting. Um, and what we're thinking about doing is actually maintaining uh, exposure to the sector by accumulating some AMD into, if AMD has a bit of a pullback after that big run up that we've seen this month, and just switching some of our NVIDIA stock into, into AMD so that we maintain exposure to the sector, but just diversify it so that we don't have a company specific risk uh, around that stock. Um, so that's what you're doing. Other one, we don't hold UPS. That was the other big mover, but we can talk about that in a bit as well. So that's kind of the, the picture of what the US market, the S&P 500 sectors have, have been like over the last month. Um, I thought I was going to kind of go through the earnings calendar nicely for you. So I picked these up of IG markets. Um, I thought, oh, this is such a nice way of displaying it. It'll be so visual that you guys can see when the results are. And that, you know, that was, that's uh, July. And that's August, so you can see it's been it's a busy period for us at the moment. There's a lot of earnings coming out, a lot of things to try and digest uh, around the portfolio. And then I realized, well, you know, while this is the updated version, it's all wrong. So I had to do this for you anyway. So they've got them all at the wrong dates. So it's a nice visual way. So sorry, this isn't quite as visual, but these are the big uh, earnings that are coming out. Um, so as I said, uh, in the next week or so, uh, we're going to be particularly interested on the 12th for Disney. I've talked about Disney on this call before. We like Disney above uh, Netflix. I really want to see what's happening in Disney's, um, uh, in, in what's happening with their Disney Plus subscriptions, uh, and also just what, what the impact of opening the parks has been. Uh, as I said, on the 19th is NVIDIA. That's a key, key uh, one for us. Salesforce, I'm looking forward to as well. Like I, I think, you know, any, any new implementations, we're going into Salesforce ahead of, um, ahead of those results. Uh, remember, they've been in particularly upbeat on, on what they've done, uh, just in terms of the whole idea of working from home. The requirement around uh, CRM systems has, has you know, increased dramatically. Um, you know, as people don't work in offices and, and, and they're a lot more remote. Um, they had spectacular, you know, they had a huge, uh, you know, last quarter, there was a big jump in stock price based on the results. Um, it's kind of since then subsided. So I'm really interested to see what's happening inside those results. Um, you know, and then of course, Monster, you know, Monster Beverage Company run by South Africans, which is great, or, or founded by, I think founded or, or they were key in, in creating Monster Beverage Company. We don't hold it, but, but an interesting one to, Look at and yeah, Broadcom also you know kind of in the um, 
Broadcom in the semiconductor space, and then Coinbase might be interesting as well. I don't know when that's going to release. I actually don't have the list up. Um, yeah, so that's what's coming out. Uh, which, yeah, just keep an eye on those earnings. Uh, we are going to circulate the presentation. Of course, Home Depot also in the portfolio. We're kind of going to be watching that quite closely. Um, this is just, okay, so this is, so we're about 50% of the way through earnings season. So, so we've had about half the, the big companies report of the 2,000 or so companies that, that are in the, in the market. Um, and this is just a little uh, snapshot of what, uh, how the companies have actually performed. And this is a two-day performance following the result. Uh, as you can see, Nike, we discussed last month, massive run-up in Nike share price, really happy we executed all clients into Nike. So all new portfolio money was put into Nike three days before those results. So I was really happy with the result there. Um, so that's been linked. We don't own Snap, uh, but uh, that's okay. Square, you know, these, these are kind of the things AMD, like I said, big share price reaction afterwards. Uh, Procter & Gamble we've got. So that's kind of like the you know, list of companies if, you, if you're trading, those are the, the biggest share price reactions. These are the results that kind of uh, have, have made the, the market a little bit more nervous. As I said, UPS, United Parcel and Parcel Service, actually beat earnings and beat, ex, uh, beat uh, revenue expectations and the stock still fell. And it's just because the market has become so accustomed to UPS just smashing, smashing the market um, that even when it beats uh, the official published estimates, uh, it wasn't good enough for the markets. And I think people are a little bit concerned that with the opening up, the, the idea of um, you know all the couriering and moving things around and the online shopping is not going to be as strong. Um, and they were hoping for a little bit more. Uh, we don't own, own UPS in the portfolio though. Um, yeah, like I said, Amazon, we're going to talk about in a sec, uh, but that's kind of on the downside, what's, what's going on. Um, so let's have a look at Amazon. So Amazon is a significant weighting in our portfolio. It's been a little bit of a drag this month, but uh, should we be concerned is really the, the, the question that I, I think should always be addressed when you've got a, a sell-off like this uh, on the back of company results. Was there something you know, fundamentally wrong uh, with the business? Um, not at all. Uh, Amazon looks like it just ran a little bit ahead of itself. So you know, it's difficult when, you know, for the, for the quarter they made $113 billion. <laughs> That's what Amazon made. It's a monstrous company. Um, the estimates were for $115 billion. So for the sake of a couple of billion, I mean, it's just a couple of billion, um, the stock got, got, got smashed. Um, the earnings actually came in way ahead. So they only missed on their revenue number. They didn't miss on their earnings number. Um, and that's why I've kind of put these other two charts up as well. So remember with Jeff, okay, Jeff that's another thing that happened this month. And Jeff Bezos went to space. <laughs> so a lot happened this month. Um, but uh, yeah, so traditionally what happened is, uh, you know, Amazon has never really focused on, on profits. The whole idea behind Amazon as a company was, you know, your, your, your margin is my opportunity. So they would just go and undercut everyone, steal their business model and, and, and it would become an Amazon, Amazon product, buy them out, very ruthless, ruthless company the way that they operate, which is great for shareholder. Um, you can see the revenue numbers, like, I mean, a little bit flatter, and these, these the blue lines are revenue expectations. Uh, the thing is growing solidly all the way through. And they, what, what's happened is, you know, we, we've just had the Q2 numbers come out now. Q2 numbers slightly higher, just not quite those revenue numbers, not quite at the 115 billion that everyone was hoping for. Expectations are now for a much weaker Q3. So part of this is that Amazon gave a weaker outlook. So because they said, listen, guys, we've got very tough comps here. We've got like, you know, we really boomed under coronavirus because people couldn't go to shops anymore. So they just bought stuff on Amazon. We were, we have really tough, you know, kind of figures to match to. Uh, and they gave a weaker expectation. They just said, guys, listen, we're, we're not going to make as much money as you expect. Um, that little revenue bar is now, you can see, is actually they're expecting a, a slight, like analysts are now expecting, they were so negative about this. Analysts are expecting a slight decline in Amazon's revenue. Personally, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think you're going to get, uh, you know, I think Amazon's revenue will grow again in the third quarter. Um, I've kind of given you like a little breakdown there. If, you, if you're not familiar with Amazon's kind of like underlying products. So online stores, that, that kind of buy and selling makes up about half the company. Uh, Amazon Web Services only makes up about 11% of the company. And that's where I see real growth. I think Amazon Web Services is going to do exceptionally well. Um, but I, I think that I think you're going to see some growth in revenue, and that's what matters. Now, what's more interesting, though, is if you look at the last couple of years, what's happened to the earnings in Amazon. Like I said, Amazon never used to make earnings. I mean, it grew to one of the world's biggest, most valuable companies without ever making profits. Um, what's happening now, they're starting to allow profits uh, through to the company as the company matures, and you're actually going to get some profit 
uh, drop into the bottom line. So, you know, that's that's interesting. It is a bit of a change. So maybe that is something to be a little bit concerned about. Why are they changing the, the winning formula? Um, but, you know, when you're concerned that a company is making profit when it didn't make profit before, and that's why you want to sell shares, that's not a viable argument to me. It's something that maybe you should think about, but um, for us, we still think Amazon is an absolute stock standard in portfolios. You've got to have it. Um, the, the retail market is just so much bigger than the, the advertising market. So if you compare Amazon to a Google, there's far more runway ahead of Amazon and its ability to take more market share uh, than something like Google or Facebook, which are, are dependent on, on ad spend if you're looking specifically at the FANG stocks. So yeah, I say you've got to buy it, man. Um, I'm not alone in that. So <laughs> I'm not an institutional analyst. I'm a portfolio manager. I sit on the buy side, not the sell side. But on the sell side, you can see incredible you know, incredible optimism about the ability to, to grow um, with the little sell-off here. So you can see there's the technical view up in the chart here. Um, you can see that the, the stock has pulled back. Um, you know, like bottom of the trend line is down there. So I'd say buying, you know, let's say 3,100 would be a great result. I don't know if you're going to get down there. I think it's very easy. You can see that closing the gap and going all the way back up. I would say even after these results, we understand why, um, you know, we understand that they gave a, a little bit uh, more muted uh, picture, but we, we still kind of happy to buy it. Looking at the long-term performance of the stock, I mean, this is a five-year performance over there. I mean, up 336% versus the S&P 500, up about 102%. So Amazon has been a massive, massive winner. Is this the end of Amazon's run for us? Because they said they were a little bit concerned about what's going to happen in the next outlook. I don't believe it. I think Amazon, the way that they, what they're spending, I think over, over the pandemic, they've hired like 500,000 new people. This is a growing company. This is something that we feel very, very comfortable to have in portfolios, even though it did fall 8% over the last month. For us, results driven, but still probably a buying opportunity near the bottom of that channel. Um, good things for Amazon. I wouldn't, I wouldn't panic at all, even though it was the one, one of the stocks that missed, uh, did miss expectations. <clears throat> not, not worried about it at all. Yeah, and that's kind of equity markets. Uh, I'm going to kind of wrap up quite quick now. Um, so commodity markets, what's happening in the commodity markets? So uh, top left is the Bloomberg Commodity Index as well as the, the Reuters Commodity Index. So you can see they track each other because they're very, very similar. Um, so we're looking specifically like at the July month. Uh, you can see commodities have been steadily rising commodity prices. One of the reasons we've already talked about the, the mining stocks doing so well. Uh, but you can see there was kind of a, a little spike in the index mid-month and then the commodity prices came down. Uh, last month, very, very flat in June. We, we actually had a, like a stabilization of commodities. They've made new highs again today. So higher highs, they're still in an uptrend. Um, but uh, yeah, Bloomberg Commodity Index uh, still rising, but think, so where did that come from? What, what, was the, what was the issue? It certainly wasn't precious metal. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think I've got, yeah, so this is gold, silver, and platinum. And uh, you can see for June, gold, silver, and platinum did almost nothing. They're actually, you know, slightly down for the year. They've been very, very flat. The precious metals haven't been where the commodity price boom has come from. It's been from the, the base metals and, uh, and, and, you know, other, other raw materials that are, not just used for, for speculators like gold and, and I suppose autocats for platinum as well. And, and it's more rhodium and uh, rhodium and palladium that have done so well over the last little bit. Um, so that's kind of like precious metals, which is the bottom left, a little bit thing. I should really put labels on these ones as well for you guys. Um, LCOC, if you're not familiar with Reuters, that is oil. So that's Brent crude oil. Um, you can see bread crude, like oil prices are massively up for the year, but there has been kind of a moderation in July. You know, July, we actually came into the month into a falling oil market. It's since rebounded, but it's still very, very stable. And you can see the majority of oil contracts, which are like uh, West Texas Intermediate uh, and all, all the others, Dubai, what's it, Euro, Ural's Crude, uh, Ural Sour, I think it's called, uh, all... Um, yeah, you know, all very, very flat. Uh, so so I, I think that the view that the commodity, the, the oil prices have, have kind of stabilized, I think is, is probably valid. Um, then what on earth happened? So part of this little bump up in the commodity index has actually come from the softs. Um, so if you, you look at the softs again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the green one, the one that's uh, kind of up the most, that's actually iced coffee futures. It's not iced coffee futures, like mm, delicious frozen coffee. No, it's ICE, Intercontinental Exchange Coffee Futures, up 36% uh, for the year. They've had a little bit of a spike. So you've seen a spike in coffee. Uh, we talked about grains and seeds last time. They've also been actually pretty pretty moderate. The, the one that's kind of done 
uh, you know, you had the biggest kind of logistical challenges is actually uh, the Euronext rapeseed contracts. Uh, they're up about 30%. But commodity is still elevated, no question. We're not going into a commodity decline anytime soon from the softs or the, the, the hards. But uh, now that's kind of just a quick snapshot of what's going on in commodities. Uh, let's have a quick look at the currency market as well. So what's happening with currency in August? Now, this currency is crazy, man. So, um, yeah, like I said, like we've got, you know, the, these two kind of sideways channels on the currency here that it's been bounced between them for a little bit. They kind of broke lower, made new lows that, that kind of go back, all the way back to, to a couple of years ago. Uh, since recovery, I thought that's, uh, that old kind of like little horizontal um, uh, support would become resistance, broke straight through there. Um, and yeah, now we're kind of hovering in the middle of nowhere, which is interesting. So I, I still see kind of the top of the range at about 1550. Uh, bottom of the range, I think is, you know, it has set up bottom of the range at, at about 1330. Uh, I don't think we're going to get down there, though. I think I think 14 is probably going to establish itself as a level, if anything. Um, but yeah, we've been, I mean, obviously, like I said, we, we got a new finance minister last night. But a little bit of weakness out to about 14, you know, when I took the screenshot today, it was about 1448. Actually, when I did the update, it was 1436. I updated the slide the day before. Um, yeah, so 1448, uh, you know, that's after finance minister. You know, we've also got, uh, Dan had a look at it for me before the... Uh, <clears throat> the, the presentation. Uh, we also have, um, uh, you know, Turkish lira. Uh, Real is is flat, but the Indian rupee is is weakening. It seems like the whole emerging market is weakening, really, around coronavirus fears. So, you know, not too much in 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 uh, Tito Mueni stepping down. I don't think. I think it's more just general global market factors. But what is happening with the estimates? So, as you can see, Goldman Sachs wildly bullish. Sockgen didn't make an estimate. Sockgen was at twenty at twelve twenty. Um, they haven't made an estimate now. Goldman Sachs now remains the most bullish analyst uh, of the analysts uh, that uh, made calls this month. Uh, this came out uh, two days ago, and uh, you can see there's been a little bit of a moderation. So, so the median estimate has, uh, has actually moved from, from uh, 1450 out to 1489. This is on a one year view. Uh, the smart estimate as well, also uh, from 1437 out to 1468. So you're seeing that the, the, the kind of expectation is for a slightly weaker currency in, in South Africa from the, the big banks that uh, feed this information into their banks and their, their lending books and their traders and their clients. Um, so they, these are the guys that generally do move currency as well. Uh, Nedbank, uh, Nedbank and Citigroup and AMSA all more bearish, which has been reflected in the medium price. 1450 going out to 1465 for AMSA. Um, they're back moving their target from 1484 to, to 1522. Uh, and I think a lot of these are just reacting to that looting and, and, and kind of the destabilization that we saw at the beginning of the month around the, the, the local currency as well. Investec is the only contrarian one. So they've moved from 1530 down to 1510. They actually say currency could be a bit stronger. I believe that's on the back of the commodity outlook that, that Anna Bishop is saying. It, but um, yeah, so that's kind of where the, the, the currency is sitting at the moment. Uh, 1450 for me, kind of middle of the range. I, I, I personally am taking currency out at the moment. So I'm looking at kind of about 1410 to, to externalize between 14 and even between 14 and 1420, I think is going to be the zone that I'm going to try and get the, the, the money out. That, that for me is, is, is really where, where the right place to, to internationalize some currency is. Like I said, I personally don't think we're going to see 13s anytime soon. There's, there's too many problems at the moment. And if we go into a proper risk-off environment around uh, COVID, we haven't had a risk-off environment in a while, um, you could see the currency a lot weaker as well. And you could see that 1550 back in play. Um, and 1550 are probably be buying rand again, bringing, bringing dollars back into the country if, if you're not in a rush. Um, why am I a little bit concerned about the, the prospect of the currency? It's also, I spoke about this last month again, but Russia and Brazil, uh, both all seeing increased inflation rates, but both of them have started their tightening cycles. I cannot see us starting a tightening cycle anytime, but anytime soon, I think it will happen, but uh, yeah, it's uh, still a little bit concerned. Um, global managed portfolio, sorry, I'm running out of time here. Uh, we had a bit of a, a difficult month, um, not a difficult month. I mean, we were kind of like in line with the, 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 the US more or less. Uh, if, if you track it against a doubt, our benchmark is actually the MSCI world, which I can't pull on the automated system. 
got to do that on a different system. Uh, still sitting a little bit heavier in cash, still looking for opportunities to deploy. We want sell-offs, we want earnings seasons to knock things so that we can we can execute it at nice levels. Um, we're up 16%, almost 15.8% uh, for the year, which is a great result uh, in US dollar terms. Uh, certainly, certainly looking very, very good there. Um, you know, we're up 111 percent since we implemented this portfolio. It's all done off the off the back of the modern portfolio. Um, yeah, you can get a fact sheet. So fact sheets get circulated. If you need one, just give me a shout. Um, like I said, a little bit of a more difficult month, and you can see that like we we underperformed our benchmark. I can't remember what it was exactly, but I think we I think MSCI World did. I think they did one point one point six percent, and we did uh, you know we did. Uh, no, we did 1.2, so a little bit behind. I'm really not worried. This chart on the right hand side is our relative outperformance. Uh, you can see from February 2018, we've steadily uh, beaten the market. Uh, kind of the first couple of years, we were just tracking the market, which is over there. That's where we track the market, and then kind of like the, the, the metrics and the portfolio started to come into its own. And the model we use is very, very, um, you, you know, it's very, very data driven, it's, it's very quantitatively based the way that we select uh, our stocks. And um, and yeah, it takes time for these things to work. I mean, short short term things are very very difficult. It's not a particularly active portfolio. We're really looking to capture real com company growth uh, from big blue chip kind of companies, and, and we're looking to do it you know by applying some some intelligent metrics to try and uh, at least beat uh, what a normal ETF will, will do. Um, as you can see, it's working. It's done it well. We you know, eight out of ten fund managers underperform. We're not one of them. We've only launched one portfolio five years ago. This is it. Uh, like I said, the two new portfolios have been launched now, or at least international portfolios, um, and this is what they've done. Uh, so a little, a little bit of a tick down on the relative underperformance. You can see there that's that's a little gray. Yeah, so the market did a little bit better than us, uh, so we're a little bit behind, but obviously we're coming off a very, very strong month as well. So kind of comfortable, happy with the portfolio, everything doing what it should be doing. Um, just again, in performance stats, I'll just point it out. So year, year to date, uh, we're slightly ahead of our benchmark, so we're beating the game. If we can beat again this year, it'll be the fifth year of our performance versus the benchmark based on the on the quantitative uh, kind of methodology that we use. Um, we've done 110. Call it, you know, okay. So so that that chart there is is actually 111 um, percent is uh, to, uh, you can see you've got a bit of August's performance off the system, uh, whereas this is kind of like actually to the end of last month because it's based on the kind of stuff that we get uh, audited. Um, yeah, so uh, port, uh, portfolio up 14.9%, uh, year to date, uh, benchmark up 14.1%. We're up 110% uh, versus 83%, so well ahead, of, uh, well, well ahead of the benchmark still. Um, and that's more than double your money in five years. That's, you can't ask for more. <laughs> well, you can, but you can't ask for the same risk weighting that we do. How do you think about risk? We think about risk in a lot of different ways. We think about it from a systemic point of view, but we also obviously look at the traditional kind of model of risk, which is risk is volatility. Uh, and you can see if you compare our performance in terms of volatility, so our, our performance, our performance is on a three-year scatter. Um, our performance uh, is on the left-hand side and volatility is on the right-hand side. You can see we're generating a higher performance at a lower volatility compared to our benchmark. So that's our MSCI World benchmark over there. This is off a different system again. Um, and we're kind of very comfortable with, uh, with what's, uh, what's happening in terms of the performance. Um, yeah, outperforming over three years. Uh, we're a little bit behind over the one year and I can tell you, I can show you why. Uh, again, you know, we got this big spike out because we didn't get nearly the drawdown that the, the market got um, over COVID. So we got this huge spike in our performance and we're now coming off a little bit of a higher base, kind of facing the same challenge as Amazon is facing. <laughs> yeah, we, we just did really well. So, so we've kind of given back a little bit, bit of performance after that huge spike out. Um, but over six months, we, we are once ahead, again, again, ahead of the market, uh, and we're ahead over three months. So we're ahead of every time period other than over one year. And that's really just because we, we kind of got this big rise and we went a little bit more conservative because we were locking in some profits there as well. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, if you're interested in the benchmark and what the benchmark does, um, you know, we are the managed portfolio, uh, at least we, we go against the MSCI world. You can see it is a heavily, uh, heavily US-based benchmark as well. Um, there's the kind of weightings. You can always look at this uh, on the slides when they get circulated in the email. But um, yeah, MSCI world, this is not a, this is not a, a sissy index that, that we're measuring ourselves against either. I mean, we're measuring against ourselves against a pro proper, properly 
it's a it's a nicely performing index as well. So um, you know, we're not measuring ourselves against cash or something like South Africa, uh, which we could do because we have a global mandate, but um, and we are a global mandate for South African citizens. So. That's kind of a little bit on the benchmark. I've chatted about the philosophy. It's obviously high risk because it's equity. We look at about $50,000 as a minimum uh, deposit. 1% one, 1 management fee is what we charge. Uh, it's really simple. We do a phased implementation for most clients unless you tell us not to. It takes normally three to six months to get you fully invested. And we want you in with us for at least five years. Um, we're not going to lock you in. There's a three-day settlement. If after year one, you go, hey, you've already made me 10% and I want to get out. Three days later, you can have your money. There's no lock-in period whatsoever. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of targeting 14, 20, between 14, 14 and 14, 20. That's where I'll be moving money out. Our treasury service will take care of it. It's literally as simple as signing some paperwork with us. Um, you do a local EFT and we take care of everything else. Um, we obviously need FICA documents. We need you to make an application and we need you to send the money. Other than that, that's the presentation for today. Thank you very much. I'm only five minutes over today, but uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, if there are any questions, uh, yeah, I've got about a couple of minutes that I can answer them. Otherwise, I've got to go on. But thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful.